Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to episode 112 of the Spearhead Sundays podcast. Uh, this is a chat with my good friend Greeley. He's a rapper who has also now just started stand-up comedy and uh, he's doing really well with it. He brings a very unique perspective into the comedy world because he's coming from a very Oz rap background, so he's got some fucking stories for days. Uh, please... If if nothing else for this podcast, please wait until you hear the Spider Lad story. It's probably the funniest stories I've ever heard him tell, and he's full of them. So this is a really good episode. Um, this one was supposed to be a solo episode uh, that was filmed, but I had a uh, couple of couple of shitty things happen to me this week, and I just haven't been up to in a funny mood. Uh, lost lost my dog, uh, but I'm not going to get into what, into that because this is Greeley's episode, and it's all about him. I'll talk to you about that next week. So enjoy this chat with uh, Greeley. He's, uh, it was recorded just on a whim. We were just hanging out together. We weren't planning on doing it. So sorry that it's not filmed if anyone's watching this on YouTube, but uh, we just, I was giving a tour of the radio studio and I had my phone with me and we just thought, hey, let's do a podcast. And this is what happened. Hope you enjoy. Hey, Greeley, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Lewis, how are you, man? Yeah, I'm good. Uh, this is a bit of an impromptu podcast that we're doing. Uh, Greeley's in Melbourne because you were doing the Cursor shows. Yeah. We were going to catch up and then we just ended up at the radio station. I gave you a tour and we thought we should just do a podcast. Yeah. So, sorry it's not filmed. I'm just doing it on my phone, but we weren't planning on doing it. And, uh, yeah, but we've we've got it anyway. So, we haven't spoken for on the podcast anyway since would have been around April or May last year. It'd be just over a year. I remember because I did. Remember when you came down to Hobart? How we did the Bush Doof? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, I went back and did a gig at the Bush Doof again. Oh, again. Again. Yeah. And that was that was loose. Did we talk about the Bush Doof? Have we done it when we recorded the podcast? I can't remember. I don't think we had at yeah, that no, point. Yeah, no, we didn't. No, the Bush Doof was like the last thing we did. So yeah. I guess. If if you if you don't know what a bush doof is, basically it's a uh, it's an Australian thing where everyone tries to turn a bush into a nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much it, eh? Yeah. And if you think that sounds loose, you you have no idea because you haven't seen a Tasmanian bush doof, which is another level on top of that. That one was loose. Yeah. I got um so I got molested while I was on stage. Oh, that's right. Do you remember? Yeah, I saw. Yeah. <laughs> so what was happening? Was, we're in a, a bush in southern Tasmania, mm. and a, a friend of mine had built a stage, and um, he built a bar and you know a bunch of other things that you need for. Surely a bar. that wasn't legal. Was that a legal yeah, operation? That, that was legal. Really? Yeah, yeah. It was on like um, he knows the guys that own the property, and it usually was like a fishing and hunting big air, space mm. of land that you can go there and pay to fish and hunt. But um, yeah, he he right. knows them, and I think they were in on the party because that night. Went to get to get paid for the gig. I had to travel with them back up to like the front of the ah oh, yeah the front of the whole compound, and I went in and, and they gave me money out of a till. And there was like pictures of people hunting all in this like room where there was a right. till and uh, you know some stuff to make coffee. So it was a business, right? But um, yeah. So I went back. Well, yeah, and and while I was at the gig, I was on stage and everyone was just cooked in the crowd yeah it was maybe about 100 something people maybe a bit more or less just off their face we got there really late too i yeah. think we got there like past midnight or something yeah or something we like had that. to drive for a stupid amount of time to get there and then we get there and everyone's off their fucking face i remember he also wanted me to perform and as soon as I got there, I was so glad that I decided not to. Because yeah, if yeah. I went up there and started telling jokes, yeah, I don't know what would have happened, but I don't think it would have been a good outcome. Yeah, probably not. I'm, like, oh, I'm going to turn the I'm going to turn the bangers off. Yeah. Time for some words. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fuck off. No, this, if anything that wasn't techno was definitely not acceptable. Yeah, I mean, I mean apart, oh, we got away with doing a hip hop set, but um, yeah, standing at the front of the stage, that all these um chicks in the front row started massaging my ankles yeah just because they, they weren't even massaging my ankles they just needed something to rub because they were just so off their chops <laughs> and there wasn't any you know yeah i guess i was there is thing close to that that they could rub <laughs> <laughs> mate they didn't stop at your ankles i no, saw no, yeah, yeah. you're wearing shorts i yeah. saw <laughs> <laughs> they, they didn't stop at your fucking ankles man yeah, no, were I you mean, wearing underwear 
Uh, yeah, uh, I'm pretty, yeah, I was wearing underwear, but just, I was just wearing boxers. Yeah. They ended up getting up. They were caressing my like um, scrotum <laughs> at one point. <laughs> And I was just down with it. Yeah. I'm like, I mean, it's totally. And you're, you're rapping. Yeah, I was rapping. I mean, this is definitely a hashtag me too story. <laughs> you're just trying to do your job. Mm. Some girl's caressing your scrotum. Yep, that's what was happening. Unacceptable. But I think the first time I walked away from it, and then I was like, oh, that wasn't that bad. <laughs> and I just kind of went over and let them go for it, like, while rapping. And then, then <laughs> and there was someone in the crowd throwing a beach ball at me. So I was, I was rapping, oh, yeah. punching the beach ball away and getting my scrotum caressed at the same time <laughs> it was fucked up bush do of everyone yeah so we went back and did that uh, well because like it, it fell on the same weekend as the melbourne cursor show that was postponed yeah and so we ended up going back down there and this time it was the same deal except it was a, a dress-up theme what it was a dress so even had they managed to make that even more fucked up somehow and guess what the dress-up theme was what Smurfs. <laughs> <laughs> so a whole bunch of Smurfs yeah. in the bush listening to the techno, dropping acid, yeah. looking for scrotums to caress. Yeah, that was exactly what it was. Fuck. So it was just like last year, except everyone was painted blue, wearing white beanies and white That's pants. insane, man. Yeah. But this, yeah, it was really good. We, um, we chilled down there for a bit. I went down there with Nerve and Wombat and Dundee. And um, actually got a bit loose this time. We stayed there till about four in the morning. Remember when we were driving back from the one time that you were down and we hit that car seat driving in the middle of the... Oh, yeah. yeah. That made me shit my pants. Because mm. we were not in a, in a car crash safe environment. No, <laughs> it no. It was a shit box. Yeah, it was. There was like six people in a shitty car and then we ran over something huge. Yeah, it was. Um, we were just going along a causeway. It was yeah. just like, uh, like a highway in the middle of the water. Yeah. And... Um, Boom. And then we ripped it out. We made it back all right. We survived. And um, I swear, the only, I, I'm generally only ever do safe shit. But whenever I'm in a situation that's dangerous, it's always you and your mates. <laughs> <laughs> Every time. I'm like, I'm fucking grilly. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. I was talking about it last week that I like scary people. Yeah. Because they're honest. Yeah, yeah. It's always fun. You know, fear can be quite fun. In certain ways, it can also be quite scary. But, mm. but yeah, so I went and did the bush dwarf again, and um, yeah, I guess that was the last time we caught up properly. Yeah, and uh, when we did the podcast last time, that was a couple of days after your first ever comedy set, which was opening for my show. Yeah, and and so you haven't stopped. You've been going for a whole year now, just doing stand up. Yeah, yeah. Well, that you definitely inspired me a lot with that show. Uh, I remember I thought about it, but I just got up and told a story at your show. And then a few months after that, I kept talking about um, getting into comedy. And I was like, yeah, well, I did it at my mate's show in Tassie, you know, so I want to give it another go. And um, and then I was hanging out. With, I got to know a few other comedians, and I was saying that to them. And I think one of them just said, well, fucking do it then. Yeah. And I was like, oh, true, I'm becoming one of those people that talks about it and yeah. is not doing it. So, yeah, I just started um, lining up spots and rooms and just, yeah, gave it a really good go. And uh, the Tassie scene's really good, man. The um, I didn't realise how good it was until I came over to Melbourne, but <laughs> everyone's <laughs> Everyone just... Everyone says that. Yeah, Everyone yeah. from anywhere else is like, oh, I thought Melbourne was the, the home of stand-up. Mm. And it's like, oh, we got a lot of rooms in the festival, but... We don't have any audience members in those rooms. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting how much of a subculture it is. Mm. But Tassie still, and it's funny in in Hobart, um, everyone in Hobart says that Launceston is a lot better than Hobart. Right, and I feel it's just a bit more, it's a bit more out of the picture that they appreciate people making the effort to go there and perform. Mm. But um, so yeah, just really started giving a good go in Tassie. And then over the last two months, um, coming over for the for the cursor tour, I decided to book. I think I booked twelve rooms. Yeah, all up. And um, you're essentially doing two tours at the same time. Yeah, you're, pretty much. The cursor tour and then the the Greeley comedy tour. Yeah, yeah, my own yeah my own sort of lurk. I kind of promoted it as that. I just booked a bunch of spots yeah. and just went, yeah, well, here's my other stuff if you want to come check it. But I just really wanted that experience outside of Tassie. You know, I'm pretty well known that down there for my hip hop, so 
I didn't want to. I didn't <laughs> want that feeling of oh, everyone's just being nice to me because they know who I am. Yeah, yeah. And just wanted to put myself in front of random audiences that they don't know or give a fuck who I am. And I th- which I think is that's the best place to learn your craft. Yeah, is people who are not fans, they don't know who you are. That's why I like the Comics Lounge in Melbourne because it's always like people are there to just see stand up, but yeah. generally none of them know who I am. That's great because they're kind of an older crowd, and you know I'm not really in very much old media. So you know you can just go up and there and and they'll be like, I've paid a ticket, I want to laugh, yeah. but only if you're funny. So yeah. if you can make them laugh, people who don't know who you are, you've got it. Yeah, and th- yeah, definitely, it's and that's the best experience really. So yeah, so um gone and had a bit of a crack at that and and now you know I wanted to practice as well before I did um a big hip hop show again and I was lucky enough a few months ago months ago I scored a spot doing some stand up at the party in the paddock festival yeah so that was about you know f- at least 6 or 700 people oh, awesome. on a festival stage and I did a good 10 minutes off there really that's yeah. sick man yeah was... I've always wanted to do a, a festival cuz it cuz I didn't know but a lot of music festivals in Australia just have like small stand up tents for yeah. people who just want a bit of a break from dancing and music to yeah. just relax and listen to some stand up especially if it's a 3 day festival they'll yeah. always book some for the third day and so when I did that I was actually opening up for Auntie Donna Oh, cool. Yeah, so I met those guys and got yeah, to see them. Yeah, they're lovely. Yeah, real nice dudes, and, and they did a really good set. I hadn't really seen any of their stuff before. Yeah. Um, there's another guy from Tassie called Dan Taylor that writes a lot of funny music, and yeah. he's got this Tasmanian national anthem. It's like, oh, that's we, funny. We are scum, <laughs> and like, yeah. and from all the families we come. <laughs> it's, yeah, but... um. Yeah, I ended up chilling with him and watching them. And so it was, yeah, a really good experience. They're, I, I, they're so good, man. Like, uh, yeah. they're just so different and weird. And they're, what I know, what I really like about Auntie Donna is just they seem, they've been performing that long together that they just know, like, they bounce off each other yeah. so well. And a lot of what they do is just improv and one will fuck with the other one and then it's how the other two respond to it. Like, they seem to be really on point with... They know what each person's role is and they just bounce off each other real well. Yeah. It's really interesting to watch from a... Because it's, it's a... Well, the, the performance they did, it's a hip-hop performance, but mm. it's, you know, comedy and it's a lot of a piss take. But they remind me of myself and, like, Dundee and a few other guys that I've performed with now for, like, 10 years that you do have that that comfortable chemistry. How's, yeah. how's this right? You know, um, like Bird Brain, yeah. who I perform with, yeah. uh, you know, him and I, he's a funny guy. He's always been, you know, yeah. f- funny and he, he's got a bit of ADHD, so he always gets carried away and says something stupid on stage and I'll have to pull him up during our set and go, oi, don't say this. And, yeah. and we've always bounced back and forth off each yeah. other. And since I've got into stand-up and people know that I'm doing a bit of stand-up, yeah. Uh, I catch up with Burbrain to perform the exact same style of set that we've done before, yeah. and we music. go yeah, 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 music. It's all music, yeah. but we still give each other a bit of shit, and yeah. you know, we'll like he's got a song about black bucket hats, and we'll get bucket hats on for that song and swap them back and forth. Yeah, and it's really interesting since I've started doing stand up. Now, after I perform with Burbrain, um, people from the audience will come up and say. I like how you put your comedy in your hip hop set now. Oh, cool! And it's not that I'm doing anything different than we were doing a year ago. Yeah, it's just that they know that I'm doing comedy, so they now see it as hip hop with a bit comedy. of comedy. Yeah. yeah, which is really interesting. You know, it is. It's, it is. It's really interesting to see how when you label something, how much it changes people's perception of it. Yeah, because if you're not changing anything, you've but you've just started saying, "I have the ability to do comedy." Mm. People, people just notice it more, whereas they might be like, "Oh, that rapper was was funny at points." Yeah. But now it's like, "Fuck, he's doing both." Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's been a bit of that, and um, and yeah, just the other night at the Cursor show, I was going over a bit of comedy material to 1,200 people that were also a hype rap show crowd. I'm so shitty I missed that. I really want to... I've got got some footage, so I'll send you some footage. Yeah, yeah. That'd be awesome. Because, yeah, how did it go performing to people? Because I've never performed in front of an audience that's there to see a different art form. That's interesting. I'm so used to hosting rap shows, so I kind of combined it with it. Yeah. Um, It it was really interesting. Like, the material I did was about my mate Astro headbutting Tony Abbott, 
And he's in jail now. Isn't yeah, he? he's in jail. Yep. Unfortunately, free so, astro. Free astro. <laughs> so, so what I did was I, <coughs> I started off my material. Oh, no, I know. I mean, the material starts off like, uh, "How's your year been? Have you had a good year? My year was pretty interesting. Yeah, you know and." Uh, then I bring that up, and then I draw. I did like a little bit of the first part of the material, yeah. and then got the bit where I say, and then Astro headbutted Tony Abbott, and he's been locked up. And usually at a comedy show, when I do that material, I just keep going on with my material. Yeah. But at that point, I was like, and Astro got locked up. Everybody say free Astro, and yeah, then the whole yeah. place was just like free Astro. Yeah, and then I kept on going with my material, which is know? very Oz rap. And, <laughs> yeah, so I really combined. Yeah. Um, just a few techniques that I use for hyping up the crowd, yeah. that, that chanting, mm. um, and yeah, and just really kind of reworked my material in with that, and it was really fun, man. Like it definitely, the the quiet vibe of comedy rooms makes me so much more nervous than yeah intense amped up fans. You that's know what, what I mean? that's what I like too. Like that's why whenever I do a show. I, I blast music that I like to listen to and who the people who know that I enjoy. Mm. I like too loud for people to talk without raising their voice. Yeah. I like I, I try and set the tone as, as soon as you enter the venue, it's a fucking show. Yeah. Cuz cuz I don't like a lot some other stand-ups just leave the audience just sitting in silence and they just sit there in the dark waiting for the thing to... And they, they've been sitting there for 10 minutes saying nothing and whispering. And then when you get on stage, they're like, oh, I, I need to remember how to be loud now. Mm. Whereas I like to just set that tone. As, as soon as you walk in, it's a fucking Lewis Spears show and this is what you should... You should be loud because I love a loud and rowdy crowd. Yeah, well, man, that's a great idea. Sounds like you've got a very good formula for it because, yeah, it definitely is a lot more comfortable performing to people that are a bit just more up for it. Yeah, um, and with a lot of a lot of um, like even the house I show they use a lot of just kind of like big, uh, yeah, just music and yeah. consistent. You know, just you, you're there for a bit more of a show in those regards than a lot of other stand up r- rooms that I've just been to to watch. Even mm-hmm. a headline comedian, you, you know, they might have a little bit of music played here and there, but it doesn't seem too much like a show. Well, it is. It is hard to do it when it's a lineup. The comic slams do it really well. Yeah, how like, do they do it? Well, what they do is they have really loud music that plays in between breaks, and they encourage people to get up and get drinks during the breaks, so they know that when you know the music happens, sit down and enjoy the show. And they they just have the MCs trained to just amp people up, really, and they've got their own like branded music that you you hear it and it's like welcome to the comics lounge yeah, this is yeah. what this is what's about to happen and this is what we expect from you as an audience like basically just saying that in layman terms yeah great to the crowd that's cool yeah so it's been fun man i've like definitely grown a bit more appreciation for um everything you've done over the last few years you know dipping my toes in the water and giving it a try yeah it's, um it is really fun, and it's a, it's a great. I know, I love analysing it still and just watching other people perform and. Hmm. Yeah, no, it is. It is. It is a. Um, I don't know it's just a fun industry to just get in and you can just fucking talk. Yeah. Um, do, do you want to tell tell everyone about Spider Lad, or oh, do you want to save that? Lad. No, no, no. I'll tell everyone about Spider Lad. Uh, <laughs> so every time I'm with Greeley, he has at least three stories. About just some cunt, some different person shit. doing some insane shit, and my favourite on this time that we've met is <laughs> Spider Lad. Spider Lad, <laughs> and this is real. I've seen pictures of it. Yeah. Um. So Spider Lad, is can it... I can I put the photo you showed me in the podcast group? Or are we keeping that oh, under wraps? Is it a private podcast group? Yeah. 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 But I mean, there's a by private. There's a couple thousand people in it. Yeah. Why not? All right. He'd love it. He'd love it. But, um, yeah, so a good friend of mine... Uh, I'll blur his face. Yeah, a yeah. good, good friend of mine um, got out of jail recently and he was a bit bored. <laughs> he didn't really know what to do with himself, so he got some really good pingers. And, um, <laughs> and, and he was sitting around and um, pinging off his what? head. Yeah. And he decided that he's, he was bored and he wanted to fuck with people. 
Because that's all that he did in jail. Yeah, I mean, what else do you do in jail? You just really sit around and fuck with people. Yeah. You know? And, um... And I've met this guy. He's a real big dude. He's, he's a, like 6'5". Yeah, he's a big, big guy. Big lad. And, um... <laughs> so he he came found out who all the new local uh, hustlers were in his area. You know, it's pretty easy these days with Facebook and mm. everyone wanting to be a gangster. Um, so he found out who all the new hustlers were and he found out their personal Facebook account, got on their inbox and started leaving voice messages. <laughs> just, like, just leaving like um, a good 20 or 30 voice messages and each one was like 10 seconds long and they'd just go, Oi, oi cunt. <laughs> oi, fucking call me. Uh, these weren't like regular 17-year-old dealers. No, no, they were... Um, they were legit, and so... <laughs> so it, just not a smart thing to do. No, no. If I mean, if you're scared, I guess, but he's not, so... <laughs> it's just, um, it's, it's outrageous. But, yeah, so he he ended up getting hold of a few, and he's kept harassing them, and um, been like, oh, well, let's meet up, I want to get something off you. And waits until they agrees and organises a place and time to meet up. And then he dresses up as Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> With a pair of like Nike TNs and, and a Nike hat, and then um, <laughs> r- rolls up on the dealer at like on a dark street at three in the morning, <laughs> and jumps out the car with his hands out like he's um, slinging a web, <laughs> and um, you know with the yeah with the, both hands the, the, de- the devil's horns yeah yeah except the the horizontal devil's horns I guess yeah and. Um, yeah, he whips them out and Spider-Man he... Spider-Man gang signs. Yeah, the Spider-Man gang signs. He jumps out the car and <laughs> looks at the guy and with his Spider-Man gang signs and says, Peter Parker needs a pip. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this gun doesn't know what to do. He's just there staring at, at uh, my mate in the Spider-Man costume. Oh, fuck. And he just he just got, he just knows how to have that really good like crazy eye, the old crazy eye, you know. Yeah. It's a bit of an outdated thing. Nobody talk about it anymore. But remember, like you'd see in the in old Western movies, they talk about someone has that real crazy eye or that, yeah. that hundred mile stare. Or I've something. seen some shit look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he just gives them that look, I guess. While doing the, the, um, the deal is either like this dude's either insane or he's like a genius. Yeah, yeah. Well, either who, way, who dangerous. Knows, who knows what you'd think, really? And um, <laughs> yeah, so then he they, they said, "Well, what do you want?" And he goes, "Oh, you got something for me?" And they go, "Yeah." And he, he gets it off him and has a bit of a look at it, and um, they're like, <laughs> "I couldn't imagine." Just being like, all right. It just, it was just trying awkward. to sell ice to a guy dressed up it's as Spider Man. I guess they're just sitting there awkwardly. I mean, what else do you do? <laughs> you know, they're just there, kind of like, oh, well, all right, we've, we've come all this way at three in the morning. I, I definitely want the money for the transaction, but I don't know. What else would you do? You yeah. just kind of go, oh, okay, mate. Like, obviously, try and gauge how seriously he's taking himself, but yeah. my mate was just pretending to be very serious, so. Yeah, so he um he takes the gear and, and then they ask for some money or or whatever and he and he goes no <laughs> N- no Peter Parker doesn't pay <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they're like oh no come on man like no nah, we need the money and he's like no 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 I can give you a Peter Parker pinger though <laughs> <laughs> and at that point a Peter Parker pinger. <laughs> At that point, he shouts them a pinger. Oh, fuck. And gives them a pinger and says, I'll see you later. Man, and then, that's the real pinger peach shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the, it's the real pinger peach, bro. <laughs> that, that is the real pinger peach shit, eh? And then he goes home. Pinger Peter And then he, then he gets back on Facebook, yeah. goes back to their inbox, yeah. sends them more voice messages like, hey, bro, we should catch up again. <laughs> should catch up. Got any more gear? Oh, and these cunts, at this point, you know, usually they'd be like... Yeah, they would know that it's him. Oh, they know exactly. They know what's going on. <laughs> but they're so confused yeah. and so frustrated that they've been rolled for their money as well as they just kind How of... How embarrassing, getting rolled by a dude dressed as Spider-Man. Yeah, I think... And then, yeah, they'd be dealing with their own embarrassment 
And so they just yeah, hide from him rather than going to get revenge in any way because he instantly hits them back up like, let's catch up. Yeah. They're just like, oh, no, leave me alone. Like, yeah, you've already got confusing. my money. Fuck off. Like, yeah, it's like, yeah you, know what? you know, how do you scare a person who can do that to you? Yeah. It's, um, Man knows no fear. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, fucking hilarious. Has he just done that to the one person? No, he's done it to about ten different people now. So, <laughs> so there's gotta be there's gotta be like a myth going around oh, fuck. of Spider Man like <laughs> Spider Lad. Spider Lad. Spider Lad. He's like the Robin Hood for crack. Just oh. going out and, <laughs> but um yeah, so that was a good one. We had a good laugh about that when we caught up. Um and we got on the pingers. Yeah, I got on the pingers with Spider Lad and my other, my mate Manners, who's blind. And um, we're in this hotel in, in Melbourne City. And I don't know if you've ever hung out with Manners when he's getting loose, but he's a ruthless... A couple of times, He's yeah. a ruthless motherfucker, man. Yeah. He's a dangerous blind man. Yeah. And um, we're going out for cigarettes when we're in this hotel. Yeah. Me, him and Spider Lad. And... Um, <laughs> So you got Spider Lad, a blind guy, and me going out for a cigarette. <laughs> and there was these two awkward guys working behind the reception. Um, they were Indian, not that that matters, but just to paint the picture a bit better. And they were really quiet and awkward, and they kept yeah. giving us the look of, oh, why are you coming out every half an hour to go out for a cigarette? Mm. And you weren't let meant to smoke in the alleyway outside the hotel, and blah, blah, yeah. blah. Kept just giving us looks. Yeah. And then so um, Manners was like, fuck this, man. I'm going to go fucking talk to those cunts. <laughs> and then I was like, no, nah, man, it's don't. He's like, no, nah, man, fuck them. They keep, they keep, they're not even being polite to me. And so Manners has walked inside, and he had his cane on him, so he's yeah. you know, walked inside with his cane. They can see that he's blind, and he's, he's, stood, he's stood in front of the reception desk, stood his cane up on the ground with both of his hands resting on the top like, yeah. a, like a pimp G. Yeah. And Manners has just gone, what's up? <laughs> at, at the top of his, <laughs> oh, fuck. at the top of his voice to these to these awkward um Indian guys, and they just kind of sat there and stared at him and still didn't talk because he just yelled "What's up at them yeah and um yeah uh they still didn't talk to him, so he he goes, "Look, I'm really disappointed in you guys." I have Asperger's syndrome. <laughs> and, and my social worker told me that I need to try and practice being social yeah. with people in public. And he doesn't have Asperger's. No, no, no. He's blind, but he does not have Asperger's. Yeah. But yeah, he started guilt tripping these two poor, <laughs> poor Indian guys working behind the reception desk in this dodgy ass hotel that was obviously just being used for prostitution. Yeah. Um, started lecturing them about how they're bad people for not helping him practice his social skills because <laughs> his, his, Asper, or his social worker told him that he really needs to improve his... Which his, is a pretty aspy thing to do. It is, hey, yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> so that was, um, that was funny. And then we went back aside and hung out for a while and Manners had to go to the airport at yeah. like 8 o'clock in the morning, and this yeah. is like 5, 6 in the morning, so he had to leave pretty soon. Yeah. And I'm pretty worried about him. I'm like, man, this is pretty loose. And I mean, he had a mate with him, this other yeah. fella that was um, come over, and, and this guy doesn't really get on it much, and he'd had, had a pinger as well. Mm. And so he was feeling it pretty hard, and yeah. man has had another one, and then they've gone to the <laughs> airport. And then went to the airport. And then went to the airport. Fuck, that's and, how you get a cavity search. Yeah, I was, oh, man, I was worried. And then... He calls me up when he gets to the airport. I'm still back in the hotel room. Yeah. And he's like, fuck these dogs, man. <laughs> and I was like, what? What are you doing, bro? And he's like, man, fuck these cunts. <laughs> they're, they're trying to fuck with me, bro. I'm like, who? He's like, the staff, the airport staff. They're trying to fuck with me, you, the fucking maggots. And I'm like, what are you talking about, man? They're there to help you. You're blind. You need assistance. Yeah. Well, you got Chris, but you know they're not there to fuck with you. And he's he's like, I've got a, I've got a knife in my pocket. I'll fucking cut them grills. I don't care. I'll fucking cut the airport staff. They're fucking dogs. <laughs> and I was like, bro, you can't. What are you doing with a knife in your pocket at the fucking airport, man? It's but, like you've got to go through security. Like the, you can't have a knife in your pocket. Let you can't stab the airport staff, man. It's, they're, they're there <laughs> Not to help. advisable. No, no, they're there to help you, bro. I'm like, where's Chris? 
And he's like, I don't know, convulsing in the fucking toilet for all I know. <laughs> oh, my God, fuck. <laughs> so I'm pretty worried about, you know, the situation. I was really stressing out. And I'm, and I'm thinking, like, he's just going to full next-level delusional mode, you know, just yeah. pinging off his chops, like, just, oh, <laughs> fucking... <laughs> And, um, you know, thinking that the staff's turned on him and I don't know where he got the knife from. And, yeah, and he, 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 I was screaming on the phone, just calm down, bro, snap out of it. Yeah. And then he just goes, no, nah, I'm fucking with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to jump on the plane now. Chris is sitting right next to me. Oh, I'm like, that's oh. so funny. Oh, I was like, oh, you can't. He's a fucking dog like that. Yeah, He's man. done it to me a few times as well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he is, um, he's a hilarious person. I was going to say, halfway through that story, I'm like, I don't think I can put this out. Yeah. If this is what he actually did, I don't think he'd appreciate it. But yeah. then he's fucking with you. I'm like, all right, that, yeah. does, that does sound like matters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was just fucking with me. That's yeah. so funny. Oh, man, it was a it was an interesting one. He got me going, though. I was like, oh, you can't. I was angry after him. He told you I was fucking with you. I was like, yeah, well, you know you shouldn't be in the airport with a... Oh, fucking with me you know like yeah. I was just so angry but I was glad that he wasn't actually about to stab the fucking air hostess <laughs> that's funny as fuck yeah man so that was a that was a funny weekend and um yeah um what were you talking about hairy man before a uh, hairy man so <laughs> I haven't I haven't heard this story Greeley just started saying oh did I ever tell you about hairy man and I was like wait for the podcast yeah yeah we'll wait for the podcast um I, it's just, I think it's really cool I've heard about him for years he lives in very deep down southern Tasmania near like Franklin yeah. which is like way past past Hobart so pretty yeah. pretty green down there you know it's just everything's cold <clears throat> and wet yeah and rain foresty mm. And, um, yeah, as far as I know, I think he might be ex-military service. Yeah. I'm not 100% sure. But all I know is is that he doesn't like the rest of the world. Yeah. And he decided that he wants nothing to do with all the bullshit. So he got a big bit of property down the very, you know, middle of buttfuck nowhere in Tasmania. Yeah. Um, created this kind of little village for himself. Yeah. He blew up the driveway to the village with dynamite, no. like literally blew the driveway up. Wow. So you can't get there from the road. And um, <coughs> and just built his own, yeah, little village where he's got like a main place and a few cabins and um, a big dining area and then there's a big stage. And um, Wow. And he just performs down there for his friends. And I just heard about him for ages and just hairy man. And <laughs> hairy man. Yeah, hairy man. Apparently he's just real hairy. Yeah. Like a beard or just all over? All over. Right. And it's just this kind of like Sasquatch-esque Tasmanian <laughs> guy that just keeps to himself and hates yeah. the rest of the world. And, yeah, I'd heard about him for years. And then I was um, I was, I was at the Brisbane Hotel in Hobart yeah. where you performed at last and I was chatting to Gibbo. Remember the guy, Gibbo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he owns it? Yeah, he, yeah. he runs it. He's... um. Yeah. He's running for ages, and I was chatting to Gibbo, and I brought up Harry Man, and Gibbo goes, "Oh, Harry Man, I know Harry Man. Mm. I've been invited down to his place for some of the parties." And I was like, "Really?" And then, um, yeah, apparently he just has like week long parties where he invites all the <laughs> rarest people he knows, yeah, and, and like just interesting people that are you know into different music and performance, and yeah, so guess, Spider Lad will be there. Oh yeah, Spider Lad will be there. <laughs> Doing a demonstration of how to, how to fucking. Anyone want to buy a Peter Parker pinger? Yeah. <laughs> how to rob crackhead Tasmanians? <laughs> we need Spider Lad in Tasmania. Yeah. Yeah, we want to get him down there. <laughs> get him on, straight onto the job. But um, yeah, and then, and then so I found out that he has these week long parties where people just go around and they just like take turns performing for each other while partying. And it yeah. Sounded really cool. And then. Just before I flew over here, I found a video on, it's like it was on a meme page, just like a big yeah. Facebook meme page that was called Shit Aussies Say. Yeah, yeah. You know the one? <coughs> yeah, I think I've seen it. Yeah, it's just like, and um, someone had posted a video of Hairy Man 
si- right. sitting in a random pub yeah. at like closing time in Tasmania. Yeah. And there he is, like <laughs> fucking arms, you know, he's got afros on his shoulders. Yeah. You can see the hair just like bursting out his collar. Yeah. He's he's wearing what looks like a fucking potato sack <laughs> with arms holes cut, holes cut out on the sides for his arms to yeah. poke through. And he's just sitting there at um at this bar yeah. singing um they all play Waltz and Matilda yeah. at the top of his lungs. <laughs> and no one in the pub is he's not performing for anyone. He's just sitting there kind of staring in at the abyss of nothing, yeah. just singing his heart out. Yeah. And yeah, it's just this video on on um the shitty Auss- shit Aussie say meme page. It's got like five hundred thousand views. And the, Amazing. the caption is just like hairy man singing Waltz and Matilda in a Tasmanian pub. <laughs> And I was like, that's Harry, man. That's the one, you know. Like, Crazy. And, and then I found he's got his own Facebook page. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? I thought this was more of a Tasmanian myth. Than, yeah. But it is. Like, he doesn't have anything to do with the rest of the world. I think someone just made him a fucking Facebook page. There are a and- few people like those myth people, like... Did you ever hear about headphones guy in Southland? No. He's still around. In Southland, you know the shopping centre in Southland? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a really big shopping centre in Melbourne. There's a guy who, as long as I can remember, since I was 10, he he runs around Southland with a backpack on and headphones in, just walking around really fast Southland. I've never seen him in a shop. I only ever see him walking around Southland just listen to music and sometimes he'll jump and sometimes he'll just start fist pumping, yeah. never bothering anyone, yeah. but everyone goes, oh, that's Headphones Guy. What a shit. And he's got his own his Facebook page, not run by him, but people just take photos. Saw Headphones Guy, he's wearing a red T-shirt today. And everyone's like, yeah, go him. Yeah, yeah. There's a few, there's a few of those people. There's one in Perth called um, Mad Dog. And he's just an old guy that rides a bike. Yes, I've seen Mad Dog. Yeah, yeah. in person? No, I've just all of the videos. Yeah, Have right. you seen how he's huge online? I didn't know that. Didn't you? No, I, I was, I was in, when I was in Dude, Perth. Dude, it was, was ho- a man. huge meme to just yell at him when he's on the bike. I'm going to show you this after the podcast. No shit. People drive past him and they go, Mad Dog, you mad dog. And he goes, go fuck yourself, fuck off, you can't fuck off. <laughs> No shit. Some of the best videos on the internet. That's it's just great, the man. Mad Dog page. I was I was hooking up with a chick in Perth and staying at a place and um, yeah, he used to ride past there like every second day and that's how I found out about it because she's like, oh, there's Mad Dog. He's been doing it for years. Yeah, I didn't know he was viral. <laughs> that's the same with this hairy man. You know, yeah. I thought it was just some Tasmanian myth. Turns out he's viral. Um, yeah, there's a couple, I remember a few from Frankston. Do you remember Roller Pig? The pedophile in Frankston. Oh, <laughs> yes. In, in the wheelchair. I saw him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that one. He was good. <laughs> Roller pig. Yeah, that's I what love- Rates called him. Rates called him Roller pig. <laughs> of course, it was Rates. Yeah, Rates is like, fucking dirty Roller pig. Yeah, but, he would um, go around in like a mobility scooter just like lifting up girls' dresses and yelling yeah, at what, them. Yeah, what his, what his technique was, his, the story goes when I got to Frankston is that apparently he touched up like a kid somewhere and the kid's uncles and cousins fucked him up and that's why he's in the wheelchair. Good. And he lives near Seaford train station. Yeah. And he gets in his wheelchair every fucking day and goes down into Frankston on the train and rolls into the middle of the street yeah. and pretends to need help. Oh, And goes, dog. oh, help, help. And then waits until someone... Go over and try to help him, usually a woman or an old lady, because they yeah. feel sorry for him. And then he'll reach around and try to go for this sneaky ass grab. <laughs> and <laughs> fucking roller pig. Yeah, roller pig. So, <laughs> so the first time I fucking saw him, yeah. I was like, oh, I'll go help him. <clears throat> yeah. And then someone on the street was like, don't. And I was like, what? And they're like, don't do it. He's a dirty cunt. Don't help him. And I, and I was like, <laughs> Are you sure? And they're like, trust me, he's a dirty fucking piece of shit. Don't help him. And I was like, ah, oh, okay. Okay, yeah. I, I've you know, I, I'm not really dedicated to helping this guy. He it's did. not very often that you go to help a disabled person and a stranger says don't. Yeah, exactly. There must be something going on there. Exactly. Yeah. So I didn't, and then I saw it a couple more, couple more times, and I thought maybe it was just a rumor. Yeah. And then I saw him do it, and to an old woman, and yeah, yeah he gra- an old woman. Yeah, he grabbed just her. anyone. Yeah, yeah. She just grabbed her. Like he was just copping a feel on anything, I think. But um. And she beat him with a handbag, and then uh, was, uh, a couple more times, I just saw like a bunch of teenagers tag up the back of his wheelchair, and, <laughs> and um, you know, a few people I've seen, I've told a few people about this, and they're like, "That's mean," and it's like, "Well, is it?" Don't be a pedo. Yeah, don't be a pedo. Fuck, that's funny. Roller um, pig. Yeah, um, I think Australia just has 
I don't know, it's like an affinity with weird cunts, but also naming them. Yeah. Yeah, it's because I feel like, I mean, you go to LA, there's so there's too many weird cunts to name, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, if you're going to start naming crazy crackheads in the street, yeah, then you're going to be there all day. Yeah. But, you know, we kind of come from, I know it's definitely getting worse compared to when I was a kid. There's a lot more... It's outrageous shit on the streets everywhere, you know. But it's crazy how much there's way definitely way more homeless people on, in Melbourne than there yeah, used to be. Yeah, I've years noticed. Ago. I've noticed. <clears throat> it was when Tony Abbott was in, um, was still prime minister. It was like I think it was the they they announced they were going to cut funding to homeless housing, and it was like the first time in my life where a politician made a decision and I immediately saw the effect of it. Because yeah. you know when they change stuff and they we're doing this, we're doing that, and nothing. You never see anything change. Yeah, yeah. But it was like the month after they said we're cutting funding to housing, the homeless people in the city fucking tripled. Yeah, right. Like I used to be able to walk past them. Oh, that's the lady with the cat. That's the guy who does this. This is the dude with the beard. And now it's so there's so many of them yeah. that you, you, I don't know, you see a new one like almost every couple of weeks. Yeah, I've definitely noticed it <clears throat> back over here this time, just in the CBD. Yeah. It's very unfortunate. There's a massive housing issue down in Tassie as well. Like we had um, the the election recently, and you know there's a housing crisis. There's a crisis with the hospital. Yeah. Um, the psych ward in Tasmania isn't actually accredited to have really mentally un- unstable people stay there overnight. So that's like a pub not being so licensed. What do they do? They just so it's a jail. It's not even a it's jail. Just tell people can't go. go. It's just pretty oh, much so they closed. just tell them to fuck off. Yeah, right. You can get basic treatment and then you have to leave. You know, and there's no basic treatment when your head is broken. No, there's not. It's mental health is you know, a very, very. Um, I know it's a big issue. Like someone just commented on the the thing saying the housing problems in Tasmania, just as, about the complicated problems. Yeah. As, I, as I was saying that, it's huge and. Yeah, there's a lot of mentally unstable people. There's, like, one place that's kind of... It's the halfway house when people get out of jail. Yeah. And that's just overloaded with other homeless people that, have, you know, haven't been in jail that just need, need somewhere to go. Yeah. So it's a massive issue, and it's fucking shit, considering how many... I know down in Hobart there's so many big old buildings that no one can afford to rent because they've put the rent too far up. So there's yeah. that much empty space everywhere. Like, I watched a few uh, docos about guys in England that um, just go and break into those sort of places to let homeless people sleep in them, you oh, know, awesome. and it's really <clears throat> cool. But they need to do something, man. We need to legalise marijuana. And I know just it sounds use that like to a... Pay for shit. Yeah, man. It's like doing amazing things in Colorado, for, like their homeless issues, um, done the opposite of tripled. It's like yeah. gone down to a third of what it was. That's huge. Through paying with the tax money that they're making from medical marijuana and it was recreational marijuana. Yeah. Yeah. Even in California, they're doing um, programs where they're getting people that come out of jail or they're getting the guys out of jail that went in for marijuana crimes yeah. and giving them jobs growing marijuana. Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. And Because I mean, they know it better than anyone else. If they can do it in a fucking garage, they can do it in a science lab better. Exactly, man. So <coughs> many positive... Um, positive possibilities that I think we need to, you know, like America finally passed same-sex marriage and yeah. Australia, as it always does, goes, oh, but we need to be like America, so they did it too. Yeah. Which is great. Well, we could you know, do it without wasting a fuckload of money on nothing. Yeah, or well, like have another fucking... What's everyone's opinion? Write it on a bit of paper. <laughs> you know, well, like... Do a fucking Facebook poll. You know the fucking answer. Yeah. Yeah, or just change it. Yeah. Just look at other places where it's helped. and But, yeah, it is a bit of a worry, the fucking um, homeless shit. We've got a question from Complete. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's let's do some questions. What, what are we up to here? Yeah, let's do some questions and then we'll wrap it up. What's Complete got to say? You put a status out on Facebook asking for some questions. Yeah. Well, um, I'm not sure how serious... It is, but he said... Probably not, coming coming from complete. I love rubbing barbed wire on my nipples. Yeah. But they always get infected. Uh Uh-huh. Should I stop rubbing barbed wire on them or just man up? Is the pain worth the pleasure? Do I always have to use rusty barbed wire? Should I put Dettol on my nipples first? 
Should I get a tattoo of James Franco on my leg? Please give me advice, thanks. Uh, well, I can't believe Complete's never thought of this, but he just needs to sterilise the barbed wire. I don't know what he's doing with Dettol. It's yeah. like hand wash. You need to boil the barbed wire, yeah. sterilise it, and then, uh, I don't know, rub Dettol into the wound. Probably make it a little bit better for you. He, men- he mentioned halfway through that it is rusty barbed wire. He said, do I always have to use rusty barbed wire? I mean... It depends if um, the infection is the part that's kind of turning you on. Yeah. Yeah. But um, you should definitely get a tattoo of James Franco on your leg. And, Absolutely. Um, get a tattoo of James Franco rubbing barbed wire on his nipples on your leg. Yes, yes. <laughs> that is your, um, your question answered, Sheldon. Um, I had one question somewhere here. Sorry, I'm touching my phone. I don't know if this is annoying you guys listening. Um, all right. So, I had this one question. Help with depresso girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> I've had this one. Uh, <laughs> I've hey, got you, bro. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've, I've seen you go through this. Um, hey, cunt, here's what I need help with. Uh, my name's James. I've been with my girlfriend for about two years, and the whole time I've known her, she's been suffering from pretty intense depression, and it has not comp- improved much at all. About ten months ago, she convinced me to move out with her, as she felt she needed to sort out she needed independence from her family to sort out her mental state. I wasn't planning out to move out for at least five more years, but she convinced me to move out on the basis that we would be closer to uni, and it would really help her out. Over the past few days, I've really started to think about where. I want to be in life right now and something just feels off. Uh, I've drifted a lot from friends and family and hobbies since uh, since moving out and it has started to bring my mood and happiness down a lot. Also, having to help her deal with her mental health is a huge drain on my life enjoyment as well as health. Often, I will have to stay up until like 3am to help, to help her sleep slash help her through a bla- bad night. I keep thinking about breaking up, but I know I still love her at least a little bit. I also dread the thought of what she would do if we did end up breaking up, as she has struggled with suicidal thoughts before. What the fuck do I do? Do I risk breaking up with someone I love to further my happiness? I'm honestly so lost as to what to do. Any help appreciated. Um, Yeah, that's it. Have a shit one. Yeah, interesting. Uh... I don't know. I've always, I've always been of the philosophy that you have to be first, your own priority. You got to be your own priority. Yeah. Um, but, well, I don't know. What do you think, really? I think you've had, you know, better than I would. Well, I mean, I was um, in a relationship for a couple of years where she did have a lot of mental health issues, and. I didn't know what they were. They were first diagnosed by doctors as um, depression and anxiety issues. And, you know, there, she, there was moments where she was very, very aggressive and um, it, was, it was definitely a lot higher than depression and it wasn't until we kind of... You know, she didn't really try and get help for it in the appropriate way, I guess. And um, it wasn't until after we split that she was properly diagnosed with... Um, yeah, something else that was a bit more intense. And then I learned about that, that she was able to deal with her problems. But um, I definitely have been in relationships where, you know, it can be very mentally draining. And, of course, there is, there is, a, um, there is a line that you can't cross when it comes to sacrificing your own happiness. But at the same time, I've, I've realised in my, my experiences and travels that mental health issues are where you're, wherever you go. You know, you could yeah. break up with it and, and to pursue a, a happy lifestyle and only come into more mental health issues over here. You know, it's, mental health is a, is a horrible thing that, um, you know, mental health issues is a horrible thing that you can't just escape, especially as the world keeps growing the way it is. So... I don't know, it's in the terms of breaking up with her, I think, obviously, you know, it's, it's easy in the hard times to really think of the good times and what they could be, yeah. you know, especially when you're in a relationship. People do that anyway, just in the concept of, oh, but I could be over here fucking all these chicks, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, 
when then you're single when you're just there on Tinder and well, no one's ma- hug. and no one's matching you. That's <laughs> yeah. the reality of it. You know yeah. what I mean? When you think, oh, but I could be single and be playing the game. Yeah, and so, whenever you look at something that's not in your life, you're generally only looking at the best case scenario. Yeah, and most people aren't attractive enough for the best case scenario. Yeah, it also sounds like she might be relying on you too much. For her mental health, yeah, and it's you didn't mention. I don't know if this, if you didn't mention at all, if she was getting help outside of you, mm. which really you, unless you're a trained clinical psychologist, you shouldn't be her first point of call for mental health. Yeah, you can support her, but I mean, you don't really know. Yeah, I mean, and uh, one of my one of my best friends, like she suffers with a lot of mental health issues, and. Um, and it's taken her, she's got a psychology degree that she got just so she could understand herself. Yeah. And, you know, she's... That's interesting. Yeah, and she still sees a regular psych, uh, a psychologist. Um, she's consistently, she does struggle with her, her mental health issues, but every day she makes an effort to go out and tackle them. And yeah. And even when they get back on top of her, she's still gets the shit together and has another crack at it, you know, and I think that's important. But at the same time, you can't just tell that to someone that's got a little bit of issues, you know, yeah. and they need to learn it for themselves. Like, it wasn't until she was 25 that she learned that, oh, I need to deal with my shit, and yeah. now she's in her 30s and she's very good at dealing with her shit. She still has to deal with it, but she's yeah. has a lot of techniques that she uses and, it, it, you know, so... And um, at the moment, we're in that's such a like, I mean, uh, like borderline personality disorder is becoming so common, it's not funny. Like, it's quite often this has happened to me about 10 times in the last year. I'll meet yeah. someone that's like, oh man, my girlfriend's fucking crazy. Yeah. And I'm like, what's going on? And they're like, oh, she's she just kicked me out of the house because yeah. we, we had an argument about the tablecloth. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, well, that's a bit unreasonable, you know. And they're like, yeah, she's she's out of her out of her mind. I don't get it. And then, but she's been jealous that I, I was talking to this chick the other day. Yeah, and and you know, I see her talk to guys, and I don't get jealous. But as soon as she saw me talking to that chick, she lost her shit, you know. And yeah. and I've gone, okay, well, um, the, what's her relationship with the parents like? And she, they're usually not good. And I'm yeah. like, okay, well. Um, when you guys fight, is it like has she tried to get any help? And they're like, yeah, she's got depression. And I'm like, okay. Um, do you guys ever, does she ever get aggressive when she's fighting? And he's like, yeah, all the time. And I'm yeah. like, well, depressed people don't really get aggressive. Like, if you've got depression. Depressed people give up. Yeah, you don't want to leave what's bed. The point? Yeah, I'm not going to sit here and fight you or just yeah. skits or smash something in the kitchen. You know, that's it's coming from a different sort of place. And, and eventually I'll get them down to the point where. Um, I'm like, well, have you ever heard of borderline personality disorder? And they're like, and I don't know. I'm not a trained clinic. I've just got a lot of experience with friends, and I find that, and I'm not sure if B, BBD, BPD, which is the you know, the abbreviation, I'm not sure if that's the right one for it, for all these diagnoses. But yeah. I'm sure that it's pointing people in the right direction <clears throat> into understanding what they're going through. Because yeah. a lot of the time when they're in that, they'll be like, ah, I'm having this and I'm feeling this and I don't want you to leave, but I want you to go. But stay here, I need you, I love you, I can't yeah. be nothing without you, but get the fuck away from me, don't touch me. There's so many conflicting yeah. emotions going on that... um that, you know, it's it's very hard to understand. And when you're not in that... When you're with a person like that and you don't suffer from mental health issues, you know, you're like, well, ah, and you can even you can even suffer, you can make your own mental health suffer because you're, yeah. when you care about someone that's suffering like that and you don't understand it, your natural instinct is to try and put yourself on their level, to try and understand their pain and to share it and make them feel a bit better. So really, you yeah. can be damaging your own mental health to, to do that and because um, yeah the only way you could truly understand what they're going through is if if you, if you weren't it. okay yeah exactly but that's not the right thing to do in those uh, situations which I I learned the hard way because I did you know tit for tat when I was in that situation I, and I let myself kind of 
suffer for the sake of trying to understand somewhere else. Yeah. Which is not a healthy way to treat it. Um, if anything, you need to learn how to not take things personally and understand the nature of the person that is suffering. Yeah. And that they're not doing that to take it out on you or to make you feel like shit, you know, like at times back back when I was in a relationship with someone like that, I'd be like, why are you treating me like this? But you, you're you meant to love me and I love you, so I'm going to take all this really personally yeah. when really she couldn't behave, she couldn't, she didn't control how she was behaving at that time. So it was it had nothing to do with me. Any, if anything, I was being selfish in thinking that her problems were to do with me. Her problems were her own problems that she was just trying to fucking deal with, you know, so... Yeah. So, yeah, I reckon have a look at it from that angle, bro, and make a decision. I mean, at the end of the day, um, uh, it's like, especially when you said with suicidal thoughts, uh, you know, suicide is a tough thing, but at the end of the day... Everyone is in charge of their own destiny and their life, and they're capable of making decisions for themselves. And if someone d- decides that they can't live without someone else, that's their decision, not someone else's fault. Yeah. So um, please don't u- let that use use that as a weight over the top of you, because at the end of the day, in my experience, I know a lot of people that have been with with someone that's not stable and they've said, if you leave, I'll kill myself. And when they've finally left them, they haven't killed themselves. But at the same no, time... It's a lot of the time, I suppose, they just realise the reality of being left by that person probably wasn't as bad as they were picturing it. Exactly. Be. It comes with the comfort thing. You know, like, yeah. it, it's the same nature as when you're we're a baby and you get left... You yeah. know, you don't get... You don't get breastfed and you're like ah oh, the world's fucked oh no it's okay you know it's just a basic comfort thing yeah and we, we have become so codependent especially i think with um social media and how we use it as identities and then when we're in a relationship we like you know link identities with another person yeah. to project to the rest the of the same world person. and it's the same person under one umbrella um, I think that is very unhealthy and I feel a lot of com- relationships are commonly suffering because of that nature of how we expect relationships to well, be. Well yeah that's that's why that's what I was saying at the start of it is is you need to be your own priority like I think that's why me and Jazz work well is because need I'm not sacrificing you know my priorities for her, mm. I know that her priorities are going to be sweet because she's not sacrificing them for me. Yeah. That's, you yeah. Know? So I work on what's important to me. She works on what's important to her. And then, and then because we both know that we'd be probably be, it'd be sad if we broke up, but we know we'd be all right. Yeah. And that makes us so much stronger as a couple because we're like, we can combine yeah. The the two individuals that we are that are strong and doing well, you combine it rather than what I think a lot of people do, which is try and bring two halves of a person and create one yeah. instead of two independent things standing together. Definitely. It's a, it's a very interesting one. So I guess my, my final thoughts would just be you need to decide what's too much for you and stick to that and you also need to make sure she's doing something other than leaning on you to help her mental health and yeah. try and, you know, direct her to some professional help or to see a doctor or to see anything other than, you know, leaning on you. And if she's if she won't do that or she refuses to do it, that's when you make a decision on am, am I going to be this person's crutch forever? That's it. Because, they, you know, they, she needs to want to help herself as well. And the age old old rule of you can't help someone that doesn't want to help themselves. So. Yeah. And yeah, I think it is important to put yourself first in that matter because you don't want to sacrifice your time, energy, and effort for someone that will not help themselves. But if she's making the effort, I think it's definitely worth it because I know I know times get rough and you can think, but everything would be fine if I wasn't here. But t- t- times are just as rough when you're single, you know. And there's always bullshit in the world that you'll have to deal with. Um, yeah. All right. Well, thanks for listening, guys. I hope that helps, mate. Uh, appreciate you coming on, Greeley. Oh, it's been great to catch up, man. Yeah, always good when we're in the same city. I'm looking forward to the, the, the next three fucking insane stories you have. Yeah, yeah. I've probably got a few more, but, you know, I'll we'll think save about them. them. <laughs>
<laughs> I'll have to save them for some more stand-up stuff. Yeah, that's it. Um, do you have anything to plug that you're working on or coming um, up? So the Cogs versus Dundee battle. Yeah. That's going to be... It's a rap battle. It's going to be a rap battle. And if anyone out there can remember 360 vs Cursor, it was a big rap battle. I hosted it. And um, I feel that I haven't put on a, a battle event in years and I'm coming back to put this event on. And I really want to make this the the biggest rap battle in Australia has seen yep. in nearly 10 years. And um, so make sure you keep an eye out for that. Uh, Dundee is actually Australia's best battle rapper at the moment. He's, for sure. He's won yeah. two in Canada, two in England, one in South Africa, one in New Zealand. He's really representing... To win internationally, that's a huge deal. Yeah, and um, and Cogs is a, is a big artist from WA. Um, he's got a lot of fans, so it's kind of like it's a very uh, Conor McGregor, Floyd Mayweather yeah. situation with That's rap because cool. they've both oh, got no, different backgrounds. That. That's very true. It's yeah, it's it's going to be a great matchup. So that's mainly what I'm. Um, I'm promoting the moment. It's going to be through THC TV, which I was talking about last podcast. That's really flowered into its own. Um, That's really turned into what you were talking about. It turned yeah, into, I think, man. It, it has. I mean, it's it's been a great medium and a platform to use to connect and network with other artists and promote them as well as everything I'm doing and and just my morals <laughs> within what I believe is yep. is good with um, music. So. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for coming on. Thanks for listening, guys. Uh, I'll talk to you next Sunday. Have a shit one. Cheers.